For this session, we will talk about capital structure and your cost of capital. So when we talk about your capital structure, you've learned before, even in our past discussions, even as early as your introduction, that when we talk about your capital, this is the proper mixture of those items which finances your asset. So when we, still, when we talk about your capital per financial management, this is your liabilities and your equity. So when we talk about your capital structure, we look now into the weight or the uh, components of your capital. So we look how much is funded by liability. So what is the percentage of liability and what is the percentage of equity? That is your capital structure. Now we go with your cost of capital. So when we talk, when we talk about your cost of capital, remember that your capital finances your asset and the financing of your asset is not free. It is not free. It bears the cost. So what is the cost of this particular capital? So if our capital is liability, therefore the cost is interest. And if our capital comes from equity, therefore our cost is a dividend. Later, when we compute your cost of capital, you will see that when we compute the cost of capital expressed in percentage, your liability or interest or your cost of capital of your liability really is based on your interest. And the cost of capital of your equity is based on the amount of dividend. Okay. So again, for this afternoon, what will we talk about? Your capital structure. We learn about the proper weights and what is the proper mixture of your capital. So how much of your capital is financed by liability and what is financed by equity. Furthermore, we determine the cost of capital, but by determining the cost of capital, we try to express them in percentages. And this percentages is based on the interest and based on the dividend. Later, we will learn different formulas on how we compute for the cost of capital, particularly for equity and for your liability. And finally, after we finish discussing both capital structure and your cost of capital, we will learn the optimal capital structure optimal capital structure. So in your optimal capital structure, we blend now the cost of capital and your capital structure. And whatever has the lowest cost of capital, that is your optimal capital structure. So for example, the cost you have computed for your liability is 14%. The cost you have computed for your equity is 12%. Now we try to weight your liabilities and equity. So the proper weight, which gives now the lowest percentage, is your optimal capital structure. So by the end of this session, we will also learn about your optimal capital structure. Let's start now and discuss your cost of capital. So what is the cost of capital? So when we talk about your cost of capital, this is the amount of your return of your provider of funds. So in our part, as the in investee as part of the investee we are the one who receive the funds we call them costs on the part of the investor who provides for the funds they call it return so our cost is the return on the part of the investor therefore when we talk about cost of capital on our part on the part of the investor that is considered a return out of their financing so these are the return that the enterprise must pay to satisfy the, the provider funds. And it reflects the riskiness of providing the funds. Why? Because cost, you equate it on the part of the provider as a return. So the return here signals the investor. What does your return signals to your investor? It signals whether you have a high return or a low return to determine the riskiness because as a rule if there is a high return therefore you have a higher risk out of your investment but if you have low return you have a lower risk out of your investment as a basic rule of the higher the risk the higher the return and the lower the risk the lower the return now take note on our part as the one who has liability or equity, 
whatever is the cost or the interest and the dividends, we call them cost. However, for the investors, we call them return. Okay? Now, when we talk about your cost of capital, it is defined more on the purview of your providers. So this is the return that is required by the provider of the fund. On our part, this is the amount of our cost that you now pay to the provider of the fund. So on our part, it is a cost or an expense. On the part of the investor, it is a return. And furthermore, it reflects the riskiness of the providing of funds. So as we learn, based on your return, it will now signal the investor the risk of that particular provision of fund. So if there is a high return, the high the risk. The lower the return, the lower the risk. Furthermore, the cost of capital is an opportunity cost of finance because it is the minimum return that the investors require. So it is the minimum return that the investors require. As we have explained, that is the cost on our part and it is the return on the part of the investor. The goal of your cost of capital is your optimal capital structure. As we said in our introduction, later we will compute the different costs of capital. We try to weight them based on our capital structure and whatever is the lowest percentage based on the capital structure that is our optimal capital structure. So what is this optimal capital structure? This is now the combination of your debt and equity financing, so the cost of capital, that is your financing both of your liability and equity. And then we try to weight them. We look which minimizes the cost of capital based on the weight. So let's say the debt is weighted at 40% and equity is weighted at 60%. So based on this percentage, we compare with it with other combinations of your uh, cost of capital, whichever gives the lowest combination is your optimal capital structure. Why? Because we want to pay the lowest cost. We want to pay the lowest cost. Furthermore, this low cost on the part of the returns of the investor, it provides for a low return. If it provides a low return, it signals now our investors that they are giving or providing funds to our firm at a low risk. When we say it is at a low risk, it means that perhaps you have a better credit rating based on that financing because you have a low risk that you will default on the payment of that particular financing. Okay. So again, the goal of your cost of capital, after we compute the cost of capital, the cost of your liability and equity, we try to weight it based on a capital structure. This capital structure, we determine by how much is... Uh, how much is financed by debt, how much is financed by equity, etc. And then based on the cost and the weight, we compute now the lowest. Whatever is the lowest is the optimal capital structure. That is the best combination of your debt and equity financing that will minimize the total cost. Now we start by determining the cost of our ordinary equity. Cost of ordinary equity or ordinary shares or common shares. As we all know, the cost of your equity is based on dividend. Okay, The cost of your equity is based on dividend. Therefore, in getting the cost of your equity, we use this model. The model is your dividend growth model. So what is this dividend growth model? So this assumes that the market value of the share is directly related to expected future dividends from the shares. So the expected future dividends is related to the market price of the share. So if you try to look at this formula, we have this at the numerator, the dividend. And at the denominator, the market price. Okay. So based on this formula, we have here your expected dividend. That is your next dividend 
the current dividend multiplied by 1 plus growth rate divided by 1 less flotation cost multiplied by the price. So why do we need to deduct the flotation cost? Because generally, uh, equities, particularly share issue ones, you have costs on the issue ones of the shares. This cost on the issue ones of the shares is known as your flotation cost. So uh, what we need to determine here at the uh, denominator is the net price of selling the stock. So what is the net price of selling the stock? That is the price less any flotation cost. So why is it one less flotation cost? It is one less flotation cost because generally flotation cost, if represented by percentage, you can just deduct it here. One less the percentage of flotation cost. But if flotation cost is represented by an amount, you can deduct the flotation cost to the price per set. So price less flotation cost. Clear? Again, on the denominator, we have here your net price of selling the stock. So what is the net price? The amount of your price less any flotation cost. So flotation costs are the cost and the issuance of your equity shares. Okay. So on the issuance of your equity shares, you incur costs. That's why it is now netted with flotation costs. So expected dividend all over one less flotation cost divided by, I uh, multiplied by the price plus the growth feed. Okay. So again, dividend growth model basically is based on the uh, idea that your dividend is tied up to your market price. So if you look into our formula, it is really based on the dividend that is tied up to your market price. Why? On the numerator, your dividend, and on the denominator, we have the market price. Again, on the denominator, you can use one less flotation cost multiplied by price if flotation cost is represented by a percentage. But you can use price less flotation cost if flotation cost is represented by an amount. Okay, so for example, your flotation cost is ten percent. You can use one less ten percent. If your flotation cost is two pesos, then if the market price is fifty-two less two, if it's ten percent. 1 less 10% multiplied by 52. That's how it works. Okay? So if flotation cost is represented by percentage, use this formula. If not, then you can use P less F because, again, we need to get the net price of selling these stock. Let's have an example. The Purple Pot Company's stock is selling for 52. Its last dividend was 4.5, and the firm is expected to grow at 7% indefinitely. Flotation cost associated with the sale of common stock are 10% of the proceeds reads. Estimated pepper pot's cost of equity from the sale of new stock. So first we need to get for our current dividend. DO or D0 is your current dividend. Your current dividend is 4.5 pesos. Next, your market price, it is equal to 52. Our growth rate is 7%. And our flotation cost is 10%. So what is our formula? That is your D0 multiplied by 1 plus growth rate divided by 1 less flotation cost multiplied by your market price plus the growth rate. Okay. So using this formula, our D0 is 4.5. And then we have 1 plus growth rate, which is 7%. Growth rate seven percent, and then one less flotation cost. Our flotation cost is ten percent, multiplied by your market price, which we have identified as fifty-two, and then our growth rate seven percent. So again, what is our formula? Current dividend, which is D zero, which is four point five multiplied by 1 plus growth rate, divided by 1 less flotation cost, multiplied by market price less growth rate. Therefore, our cost of equity is 17.3%. 17.3%. Okay. 
to this it's now the cost of equity from the sale of your new stock okay so just to remember uh how do we estimate for the cost of your equity we estimate the cost of your equity particularly common shares by using this formula by using this formula next cost of your retained earnings Okay, so what is this cost of retained earnings? So your equity can be based on your issue one sets of shares or from your income or your retained earnings. Okay, for your issue ones of shares, of course, you incur flotation costs. While for your income or retained earnings, this is just purely reinvested in the firm. Therefore, no need to reissue. No need to reissue. So if you try to look at it, the formula now, since we are using dividend growth model, is still we relay the dividend to the current market price. If you try to look into the formula now, there is no flotation cost. There is no flotation cost. So why is there no flotation cost again? Because your retained earnings is from your income. And your income, you do not issue your income because this is what you earn. So based on what you earn and it is retained now in the company, you try to reinvest the retained earning. Therefore, you need not to reissue it. Since there is no need to reissue it, there is no flotation cost. So in our formula a while back, we have your cost of your common stock. We have your D0, which is your current dividend multiplied by one plus growth rate, one less rotation cost, multiplied by market price plus growth rate. Now for the cost of retained earnings, take note, you will not need to reissue it. Therefore, there is no rotation cost. So the formula now is D0, one plus growth rate, divided by market price plus growth rate. So as you can see, there is no flotation cost. So here, in your cost of common stock, there is flotation cost because you, did, you need to issue it. However, for retained earnings, there is no flotation cost because you do not need to reissue it. Okay. So again, what's the difference on the formula of computing your cost of equity of your common stock and your retained earnings? In your common stock, there is flotation cost. In your retained earnings, there is no flotation cost, but they both use the dividend growth model wherein the dividend is tied up to your market price. So let's have an example. A share has a current market price of 96 and the last dividend was 12. The expected annual growth rate of dividends is 4%. So dividend, all dividend or the current dividend is 12. The market price is 96 and our growth rate is 4%. So what is our formula? The current dividend, one plus growth rate divided by the market price plus growth rate. Okay, so first the current dividend, that is 12. And then we multiply that to your one times, uh, one plus growth rate, our growth rate is 4%. And we divide that to our market price, which is 96. So 1.4%, so 1.04 multiplied by 12, divided by 96 plus 4, we will get 17%. Okay, dividend growth model under your retained earnings. Another example, the Pepper Pat company's stock is selling for 52. Its last dividend is 4.5. So last dividend, so D0 is 4.5. And the growth rate is equal to 7%. And the flotation cost is 10%. But the market price is equal to 52. Since the question is the cost of retained earnings, we use the formula for retained earnings. That is your current dividend multiplied by 1 plus growth rate divided by your market price plus growth rate. So we have already identified our current 
dividend at 4.5, our growth rate at 7%, and our market price at 52. If we try to compute it, so 1.07 multiplied by 4.5 divided by 52 plus 7%. You have 16.26%. 16.26%. So dividend growth model under your retained earnings and common stock. We also have your capital asset pricing model to price our cost of equity. So your cost of equity, therefore, can be computed using two models. First, your dividend growth model. Next, your capital asset pricing model. So in your dividend growth model, we tie up your dividend to the market price. In your capital asset pricing model, we measure it with a risk. We measure it with a risk. And this risk is represented by a beta factor. This risk is represented by a beta factor. So let's learn about this capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model can be used to calculate the cost of equity. We already know that one. And it incorporates your risk. If the DGM purely computes it through your dividend tied up to your market price, your COPM computed, uh, computes your equity using a risk. So the COPM is based on a comparison of your systematic risk of individual investments with the risk of all shares in the market. So the systematic risk is, of course, due to the variations in your market activity. And this risk is based on a beta factor. So the beta factor is used to measure the systematic risk. Again, your cap M incorporates the risk. And this risk is based on the variations on the market, which is now represented by a beta. So if the problem has a beta, you will use cap M. It means they try to incorporate the risk with it. And then we have your dividend growth model if it's purely dividends, okay? So if you will read soon with the reads and the beta, then that, that is cap M. So how do we compute your cap M? Your cap M is equal to your risk theory plus beta multiplied by your MRP or market risk premium. And how do we compute for your MRP or market risk premium? MRP is known as your market risk premium. Market risk premium is computed by uh, getting the difference between the market rate and the risk-free rate. Okay? RF is the risk-free rate. RM is the market rate. And then we have here your risk-free rate again. So if you try to look into your formula, it really makes sense. Because what we do here is that there is a risk-free rate and we try to incorporate the risk. And what is this risk? This risk is now represented by a beta based on your market volatility or your volatility or your market variations. So if you try to look at the formula, yes, it is really cap M because here we have a risk already and we try to incorporate it with our risk-free rate. So the formula is equal to your risk-free plus beta multiplied by your market risk premium, wherein market risk premium is equal to your market return or market rate less your risk free rate. So let's try to solve this one. Shares in Louis and Dewey have a beta of 0.9. The expected returns on the market is 10%. So market returns is 10%. And then the risk free rate is 4%. And the beta coefficient is 0.9. So again, what is our formula? So the cost of your common equity is equal to your risk-free rate plus the beta multiplied by your market risk premium. Okay, so risk-free rate, we have computed it at 4% plus the beta of 0 0.9. Your market risk premium, again, is computed by getting the market return or the market rate 
less the risk three re. so 10 less four percent okay so let's try to compute 0. 0.9 multiplied by six percent plus four percent we have here 9.4 percent as our cost of equity okay so it's kind of easy you just need to know the reason out of that particular formula and uh, what formula will be used so you use the dgm if ever you are looking for your dividends etc but if you have now a beta and you have the risk then you use your cup m under your cup m risk free rate plus beta multiplied by your market risk free next we have your cost of preferred stock okay so if you try to compare your cost of preferred stock to your cost of common stock your common stock, the dividend on common stock or your ordinary stock is not fixed. So it changes. It changes. While for preferred stock, the dividend on your preferred stock is fixed based on a percentage of par. So if you try to look at it, your common stock, it will be declared by the entity. But for preferred stock, if you have ever uh, encountered it, for example, 8% 100 par preferred stock. The 8% here represents the amount of the dividend, which is always fixed because the 8% will not change. The 8% will not change. So here, again, the dividend is fixed. Dividend is fixed. Your common stock dividend is not fixed. Therefore, what is the difference? In your cost of common equity or cost of ordinary shares, there is growth. There is growth. Why is there a growth? Because the dividend changes. While in your cost of preferred stock, there is no growth. Why? Because dividend is fixed. So if you try to look at it in our formula, it's still the same. However, there is no growth. There is no growth. There, why is there flotation cost again here? Because I told you, if ever it comes from your issuance, either preferred or common stock, you can incur flotation cost. However, if it is on your retained earnings, there is no flotation. Okay? No issuance cost. So the reason here, again, in your cost of preferred stock, there is no growth because the dividend is fixed. So again, since we are using your dividend growth model or your dividend model, then we again ut utilize the dividend and we try to tie it up with your market price. So dividend divided by your market price. Notice there is no growth here. So current dividend divided by your price less your flotation cost. So let's try. Calculate the after tax cost of preferred stock for Bozeman Western Airlines, which is planning to sell 10 million of 6.5 cumulative preferred stock to the public at the price of 50 pesos a share. The issue one's costs are estimated to be 2 pesos a share. The company has a marginal tax rate of 40%. Take note, dividend is not tax deductible. That's why you cannot get after tax. So even if the question is after tax, you just need to get the cost of your preferred stock. So what is our formula again? So the current dividend multiply, uh, divided by your market price less any flotation cost. Okay? Cost of preferred stock. So our current dividend is given here. So uh, it is 6.5. And then the market price is 50. And then the flotation cost is 2 pesos a share. So we have 6.5 current dividend divided by market price less 2. 6.5 divided by 48. We have here 13.54%. 13.54%. So that is our cost of preferred stock. Next, another example. 
Randall has a 10% hundred par value perpetual preferred stock that currently sells for 111.10. What is the cost of the preferred equity? So first, we need to get for the current dividend. That is the percentage multiplied by par. I told you to compute for your dividend. It is only percentage times par. So 10% of 100, the dividend is 10. Market price is 111.10 and the flotation cost zero. So to get for the cost of our preferred stock, we have current dividend divided by your market price less flotation cost. Our current dividend is 10, our market price is 111.10, and our flotation cost is zero. This will give us 9%. This will give us 9%. Okay? Cost of preferred stock. Next, cost of debt. The cost of debt is the return an enterprise must pay to its lenders. So you know this one as your interest. And take note, interest is tax deductible. That's why our cost of debt is equal to your rate of interest multiplied by 1 less tax rate. Why we need to deduct the tax rate? Because the net cost is equal to your interest cost less tax shield. What is this tax shield? This is the amount of interest that is deductible. So your interest cost, let's say, is the rate and the tax shield is the rate of interest multiplied by the tax rate. So interest cost, which is the rate, less the tax shield, which is the rate, multiplied by the tax rate. In short, If we try to look at it, it is equal to your rate multiplied by 1 less tax rate. Okay. So again, how did we compute this cost of debt or this formula? Our cost of debt is interest, and this interest is tax deductible. So if you try to compute it, that is equal to your interest cost less tax shield. This tax shield is the interest that is deductible for tax return. And to compute it, that is the rate of interest multiplied by tax rate. So if you try to place it in a formula, rate less rate times tax rate is equal to rate multiplied by 1 less tax rate. Okay? So it's almost the same. That's the reason of this particular formula because interest is tax deductible. So for example, our rate is 12% and our tax rate is 30%. So 12% multiplied by one less 30%. So how much is our cost of debt? 12 times 0.7, we have 8.4%, okay? Or if we want to uh, properly compute it, 12% less, 12% times 30%. 12% less, 12 times 30%, this is 3.6. 12 less 3.6, we will still get 8.4%. 8.4%. Now we go to the concept of your weighted average cost of capital. As I told you, once you have computed the cost of equity, the cost of debt and the cost of preferred stock, we try to weight them. Okay, so for example, you have computed the cost of equity at 11.86%, and then the cost of preferred stock at 12%, and the cost of debt at 8.4%. Now, in your WACC, we calculate it, WACC or WAC. Weighted average cost of capital, we calculate it by weighting the cost of each individual source of finance according to their relative importance or according to their weight. So for example, the uh, equity is 30%. And then your uh, cost of common equity, your preferred equity is 50% and your debt is 20%. If we try to compute for the WAC, we just multiply the weight to the cost, okay? So 30% multiplied by 11.86% for the WAC of your 
equity. For your preferred stock, what is the weight of your preferred stock? 50%. And what is the cost of, cost of preferred equity? 12%. And then we have 20% multiplied by 8.4%. That is your cost of debt. So what is our WAC? 11.86 times 0.3. And then 12 times 0 0.5, and then 8.4 times 0 0.2. So our WAC is 11.24%. 11.24%. So you will just weight it. So after computing each cost, you try to weight the cost. Weight the cost. That's why it's called weighted average cost of capital. Sir, how do we get for the wheat? So you get the amount of the common equity, the preferred equity, and the long-term liability. So total amount. And then let's place at as YY the total amount. To get for the weight, the common equity portion divided by YY, that is the weight. You try to just divide it to YY, which is the total amount of your uh, financing. You can now get for the weight. Okay? So to compute for WAC is relatively easy. Just get the weight. You multiply now to the cost of that particular financing. We go now to your optimal capital structure. We have discussed this a while back. It is the best combination of your sources of funds and which minimizes the cost of capital. So it takes advantage of cheaper debt and without excessively increasing the risk. So how do we compute for your optimal capital structure? So first, we need to get for the proportion. What's this KD again? KD, this is your cost of debt. KE, we have here your cost of equity. And then we have here your proportion of D. This is proportion of debt. The proportion of debt, so debt is zero, therefore equity is 100%. Debt is 10, equity is 90%. Debt is 20, equity is 80%. Debt is 30, equity is 70%. Debt is 40, equity is 60%. Debt is 50, equity is 50%. That is 60, equity is 40%. Okay, so how do we get for our uh, optimal capital structure? We get the WAC first. So how do we get the WAC? You multiply the weight to the cost. Since we have only two here, then just get the weights of the two. So 100% of equity, 12%. 10% of debt, so 10% of 4.7%. And then 90% of equity, which is 12.1. So we will get here 11.36%. And then 20% of debt, 0.2 times 4.9. And then 80% of equity, 0.8 times 12.5. So our WAC is 10.98%. Next, uh, our, our debt is 5.1, 0.3 of 5.1, and then 0.7 of 13. Then we have 10.63. Next, we have 40% debt, so 5.5 times 0.4, and then 0.6 times 13.9. So we have here 10.54. Next, 50-50, 6.1 times 0.5, and then 15 times 0.5. So we have here 10.55. And then lastly, uh, 7.5, 60% debt, and then 40% equity, 17. So we have here 11.3. So what is the optimal capital structure? The lowest WAC. The lowest WAC. So which has the lowest WAC? I think it's 10.54. So what is our optimal capital structure? At 10.54%, we have 40% debt, and then 60% equity. So that is our optimal capital structure. So let's wrap up what we have learned. So your cost of capital comes from your different capital sources. And this 
is your equity and your debt. For your equity, you have three sources. First, your ordinary shares or your common shares. Then we have your preferred shares. And then lastly, we have your retained earnings. Okay, so for ordinary shares or common shares, we have two methods to compute for it. So we have your dividend growth model and your capital asset pricing model. So in your dividend growth model, so we have first your current dividend multiplied by one plus growth rate divided by one less quotation cost multiplied by market price plus growth rate. Under cap M, this now uh, incorporates risk. So we have your risk free rate plus the beta multiplied by the market risk premium, where market risk premium is equal to your market return or market rate, and then your risk fee rate. Next, we have your preferred shares. In your preferred shares statement, there is no growth. It's still, we use your different growth model. It is only your current dividend. One, less rotation cost multiplied by your market price. Take note, there is no growth here. For retained earnings, there is no flotation. There is no flotation. Sir, why is there no flotation? Because you do not issue it. It is only reinvested. So how do we compute? DO, 1 plus growth rate, divided by market price plus growth rate. And the cost of that, it is equal to your 1, or rate, multiplied by 1 less your tax rate. 1 less tax rate. So if we try to look at it again, take note, we get the WAC, which is based on the weight of each source multiplied by the cost of the source. And the differences of the three again, flotation and growth. So we have here OS, PS, and RE. So OS and PS has flotation costs, while no flotation costs on RE. OS incorporates growth. PS no growth. RE has growth. Okay? Take note of those differences. We have discussed it anyway. Why are the formulas like that? Why is it, uh, why does the other has beta, the other does not have beta? How do we determine capital structure? How do we determine the optimal capital structure and the what? So that's it for this topic, cost of capital and capital structure.